high-profile hats he has worn. He was Texas's choice in our primary for the President of the United States. He was the Solicitor General of Texas. And of course, he is our United States Senator. Now I'd like to briefly speak with you about his less commonly known background. Many people in this room would say they were born into the oil business for their parents, and maybe even their parents' parents were in the oil patch. Senator Cruz is no different. When he was born, his parents owned an oil field service company up in Canada and provided seismic data processing. Our industry is in his blood. After matriculating through high school here in Houston, he attended Princeton, where he was a national champion debater. His record was so sterling, Princeton named an award after him. After his time at Harvard Law School, he clerked for Chief Justice William Rehnquist. Only a few short later, sorry, a few short years later, he would return to the Supreme Court to argue a colossal nine different cases. That is more than any other practicing attorney in the state of Texas or any other member of Congress. In the Supreme Court, he successfully fought the Second Amendment rights in the District of Columbia and winning a pivotal five to four decision defending the constitutionality of the Ten Commandments display at the Texas State Capitol. One of his many duties in the Senate is his chairmanship of the Senate Subcommittee on Space, Science, and Competitiveness. Our Houston neighbors in the space industry, just like our oil industry, are focused on technology, new ideas, and pushing the boundaries of the conventional and the accepted. To quote Senator Cruz, the first foot that sets foot on Mars will be an American foot and an American explorer. Progress in space, it pushes innovation in extreme conditions, technological advances for all industries. Sounds familiar, right? Just like our oil industry. And there's enormous benefits for our Houston economy, the United States economy, and for the world. Senator Cruz has been a very strong advocate of our industry, which we'll hear a lot about today. He fought against the Paris Climate Accords, and he pushed very strongly for approval and construction of the Keystone XL pipeline. Senator Cruz is a free trade advocate pushing to open new borders and new possibilities to grow our Texas economy. It is my pleasure to introduce our neighbor, our advocate, and our friend in Washington. God bless oil, God bless Texas, and welcome Senator Cruz. It is great to be with you, Justin. Mike, thank you for that, that very, very warm introduction. Thank you for your hospitality. I got to say, anytime you begin a lunch gathering with God bless oil and God bless Texas, <laughs> there ain't no confusion where we are. <laughs> it makes the heart warm. Let me pause at the outset just to reflect on what today is, September 11th. Every one of us here remembers where we were 17 years ago when that horrific terror attack occurred, the worst attack on the United States since Pearl Harbor. I was in D.C. at the time. My wife Heidi and I, we had just started serving in the George W. Bush administration. She and I had gotten married in May of 2001, so we were newlyweds. She was working in the White House. That morning, she was at work already. I was walking out of our apartment when she called the phone, said, turn on the television set. So I stopped, turned on the TV, and saw that first plane that had hit the first tower. Now, as you remember, early that morning when we saw that first plane, most of us thought maybe it was some horrible accident, somehow a, a pilot had had a heart attack, something had gone tragically wrong. And then we watched in complete horror and disbelief as the second plane hit the second tower. And in an instant, without saying a word, every one of us knew it was something different. 
knew that it was qualitatively different, that this was an attack, a vicious, cold-blooded murder on American soil. When the first plane hit, the Secret Service walked through the White House, told Heidi, told everyone else, stay where you are. When the second plane hit and they realized it was an attack, the Secret Service ran through the hallways saying, get out, run, don't walk. At that point, there were still two more planes in the air. They didn't know if either one of them was about to hit the White House. Heidi wasn't able to get her car. It was on an underground parking garage. So she took off her high heels and she walked barefoot across Memorial Bridge back to our apartment. We lived in Northern Virginia, about a mile from the Pentagon. When the third plane hit the Pentagon, you could smell the ash, the soot. Actually, a good friend of ours, Barbara Olson, was in that plane, the plane that hit the Pentagon. She had called her husband, Ted Olson. He was the US Solicitor General, someone I've known for 20 years. She actually got Ted on a cell phone on that day. Now, Ted is sitting there talking to his wife, and he knows that the two planes have already hit the Twin Towers. And she tells him terrorists have taken over this, this plane. Can you imagine the hell, the nightmare as Ted is talking to his wife, knowing she's in a plane? The last words Barbara said to Ted, she said, what do we do? How do we stop it? which for anyone who knew Barbara Olson, and Barbara was a Houston native, that was exactly the kind of fiery spirit where she was ready to take on the terrorists and stop them, but tragically that plane instead crashed into the Pentagon. We spent 17 years in a war with radical Islamic terrorism. That moment changed this country. But we've also seen incredible victories. We've seen the Taliban fall. We've seen Osama bin Laden killed. And we've seen in the last two years, we've seen ISIS almost entirely routed. ISIS has lost virtually every square inch of the territory, the caliphate that they had claimed. Radical Islamic terrorism remains a serious and real threat. But America has responded with strength and courage and valor in the wake of that attack. And then let me just say to everyone here and, and from all Americans that we are grateful, we thank the soldiers and the sailors and the airmen and the Marines and all of the heroes who defend this country and who keep us safe in a time of war or a time of peace, America remains safe and secure through American strength. Now let's talk about oil. As Justin mentioned, I grew up in the oil business. I'm sorry, in the oil business. I left the D out of that. I apologize. Uh, I was born in Calgary where my parents owned a small seismic data processing company. Then when I was four, they sold that company. They moved back to Texas. They came to Houston, opened a company, Explorer Seismic Services, in 1975. I grew up working at the company. My first job was when I was eight. My dad hired me, paying me a dollar an hour as a computer operator. He said I was overpaid. <laughs> Uh, he used to have me on Thanksgiving Day and Christmas Day work a double shift. Because none of his other employees would work and he wasn't willing to shut the computers down. Now, he was, my dad was nice about it. He'd bring me a plate of turkey and stuffing and cranberry. He was real nice about it. He said, get back to work. <laughs> and I suspect any of you that work in a family business or small business know exactly what that's like. The oil and gas business, it's had its ups, it's had its downs. We had some good days. And then I remember distinctly the mid to late 1980s when the bottom fell out. 
when oil cratered, I'll never forget the Monday morning, I was in high school at the time, when my dad laid off 19 of his 25 employees. And he came home that day, I thought he looked like he'd been beaten by, with a two by four. I've never seen my father more hurting. And he had employees, he had geophysicists who would argue with him, Rap, I'm not leaving, I'm staying. And he had to tell him, look, you've got a family, you've got kids, I can't pay you. And for those of us who were here in Houston, you remember, Houston almost became a ghost. You know, these skyscrapers just about had tumbleweeds blown through. It was a hard, hard blow to the city of Houston. It was a hard, hard blow to the state of Texas. But we came back. You know, in the six years I've served in the Senate, I have endeavored each and every day to be the leading champion for oil and gas and for energy in the United States Senate. And there's a reason for that. My number one priority is jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. And it's real simple why that's the top priority of Texans. Doesn't matter if you're in East Texas, West Texas, the Panhandle or the Valley. Texans want jobs. We want more jobs. We want higher wages. We want more opportunity. And what Texans understand, the way you get duck jobs is lower taxes, lower regulations, creating an environment where small businesses can prosper. It's not government, it's not Washington that creates the jobs, it's the men and women here. It's each of you that does it. But government can do a lot to either screw it up or create an environment where you can in turn create jobs. And I have to say, the last year and a half, with a Republican president, with Republican majorities in both houses. The victories we have seen on the policy fronts for the state of Texas, for jobs, for the economy, are nothing less than staggering. Now I recognize, if you turn on the TV, the only thing they want to talk about is the latest scandal of the day. The only thing they want to talk about is the latest tweet or Stormy Daniels. Apparently Stormy Daniels is the most important person on the face of the planet. But I tell you, for Texans, in December we passed the biggest tax cut of a generation. For the past year and a half, the federal government has been pulling back job-killing regulations and the combination of those two, the economy is booming. The state of Texas today, we are producing 33% more oil today than we did in 2016. You look at unemployment nationally, unemployment nationally is the lowest it has been in decades. African American unemployment is the lowest that has ever been recorded since we began keeping the data. Hispanic unemployment is the lowest that has ever been recorded since we began keeping the data. Youth unemployment is the lowest it has been in 52 years. At the end of the day, none of this is rocket science. You cut taxes, you simplify the tax code, you pull back job-killing regulations, and small businesses prosper, and the economy moves. How many of y'all remember during the eight years of the Obama presidency when we were limping along at one and two percent GDP growth? How many of y'all remember all the Obama White House economists going on TV saying this is the new normal? It's now impossible to grow faster than one and two percent. It has nothing to do with the massive taxes and regulations we're passing. This is just the structural condition of the American economy. They said it over and over and over again. I think Paul Krugman wrote a million words defending that proposition. The last quarter, the economy grew 4.2%. It was nonsense when they were saying it then, and it, it's nonsense now. You want economic growth? Let the men and women here grow and innovate and explore. 
And I'll tell you, I'm a champion of the energy industry because I'm a Texan, because I care about jobs. But there's also a more fundamental reason, which is the men and women here, you embody what it means to be a Texan. Look, I've many times described the state of Texas as America on steroids. That the ethos of our great state is give me a horse and a gun and an open plain and we can conquer the world. And let me say, the wildcatter history of Texas is a huge part of who we are. It's a huge part of the culture of the spirit of Texas. You know, as I travel the country, periodically I'll encounter young people often who are very worked up against the oil and gas industry, who are very concerned about global warming. 